On One Plus One, fashion designer Alex Perry, captain of industry Heather Ridout, and the talented writer who's perhaps penned Australia's To Kill a Mockingbird. Hello and welcome to the program. She's one of the most powerful women in the world of Australian business and public policy and recently returned from the G20 summit in Seoul. After graduating with an economics degree and working for a senator, Heather Ridout has been with the Australian Industry Group for more than 30 years. She explains why being apolitical is one of her greatest challenges. Heather Ridout, thanks so much for joining us on One Plus One. There's been a lot of backpatting by politicians and industry because Australia's come through the global financial crisis probably better than a lot of other Western nations. Do you share that sense of pride or are there dangers still ahead? Well, I don't think it's a sense of pride. I think it's a sense of achievement, which um, is a very important achievement. And I was just in Seoul at the G20 business leaders meeting where we engaged a number of world leaders as well, I might add. But the, you know, the feeling around the Europeans and the Japanese and the Americans, the struggle that they're going through, and, and the fact that that is going to continue for quite a long time and the cost in terms of business, the cost in terms of unemployment, it's huge. In Australia, 19 years of only three quarters of recession never linked up into a recession. Um, you know, three, three negative quarters of growth that never really were linked up so it could be a recession. We just have no idea the feelings in those countries and the despair of many people. But I think the big issue now, we've done that, we've come out of, we're very low debt um, with uh, low unemployment, um, a pretty solid uh, you know, fiscal situation generally. The big challenge now is to manage the, the upturn into this resources boom, which as Ken Henry's been saying, is going to be one of the biggest shocks of the economy in many, many decades. Do you think Julia Gillard squandered an opportunity there with reforming the mining super profits tax? Look, I, I um, haven't seen the final details and that's still to be announced of the new mining rent tax. But I think Australia did actually squander an opportunity to put in a major reform that would have been a, a better tax arrangement for the mining industry. The Henry proposal, and all of them, we, was never a tax package. It was a series of um, recommendations upon which, through consultation and um, factoring current circumstances, packages could be crafted, including um, the rent tax proposal. Uh, the government went down a certain direction. They tried to chew gum, walk, do somersaults and sing songs at the same time with that whole set of proposals and it backfired badly. You don't like to criticise one party or the other, but yet you say Australia squandered the opportunity over the tax review. Wasn't that Labor squandering the opportunity? Look, I think there was a, a huge campaign waged against it and the messages uh, the, the Australian community were strangely feeling sorry for um, extremely wealthy people who were, you know, who in now would have preferred a, a, a better rent tax. What, what Henry argued for and what I supported was a profits-based tax in the mining industry that gave a lot of the small um, exploration companies and small mining companies a chance to, to actually do what they do. Uh, currently, if you uh, under the royalty system, it doesn't matter whether you pay a profit. If you dig a, a tonne of whatever out, you have to pay royalty. Well, this tax would not have meant you had to do that. So what this was about was a reform, a very important reform to our mining tax regime and you have to realise Jane that once this stuff's dug up it can't be dug up again it's a, it's a non-renewable resource that we're talking about and that resource belongs to the Australian people it doesn't belong to anyone else. Are you disappointed with Julia Gillard? Uh, I just think the hysteria over it and the fact that we didn't have a proper debate about a proper tax reform and we had the debate in the lead up to an election uh, it was a very bad bad, bad timing um, you know and we'll see what the outcome is. But whatever, it'll yield um, important revenue, which can be um, you know, applied to important tasks. What's your motivation for wanting to be part of the government's population strategy task force? Well, see, I'm an optimist. I, I think um, population growth has served us well. If you ask people in 1950, would we want a higher population? Would we want another 12 million people? They'd have said, you're joking, no. And you're asking people now, do, do we want another um, 12 million people? And they're saying no. Um, but, you know, generally, we have coped extremely well with a higher population, and Australia is so much richer for it. Richer culturally, richer socially, richer economically 
economically. And I think, uh, you know, that's why I'm enthusiastic about it. I do not think we should let a populist, ill-informed debate by people who really just want to make Australia a bit of a sleepy hollow and a more closed economy um, derail what's in the interests of Australia and our well-being. The $37 million sexual harassment case that was brought against David Jones recently and then settled out of court, I've heard it say in some leading business circles that while the former chief executive of David Jones will be rehabilitated, the publicist who initially brought the action will never find a job in the big end of town again. In your mind, did this young woman advance the cause of bringing sexual harassment cases against bosses or did she take it backwards? I think she advanced it. I think she definitely How advanced so? it. I think there's some cost to her perhaps um, because she, you know, she, a lot of people um, were very sympathetic to him but I think she shone a, a light on a very, very difficult area that, was, uh, that is too often swept under the, under the couch and uh, I, I, I admire her for it. I think the 37 million... It was, a, it was a sort of an astronomical figure that probably had no real basis was to it. Was she badly advised? Um, well, in the end, I mean, it was a, quite a big settlement. But I think she, she was about drawing attention to a problem. It's very hard to put a value on the damage it does to people and to their careers. And I don't think there'd be many women in the workforce who haven't experienced some form of this. I have. And it is not... You have, did yeah, you say? over the years, yeah. I mean, I think most women will tell you that they've had to put up with inappropriate behaviour from time to time. And these days, it should, it should not be tolerated. In my day, people just look past it. But now, it should not be tolerated. And David Jones, it's in their interest to stamp this out. And I think the board acted quickly. And I think this young girl, she should be taken on by companies because you know, she's got guts and she stood up to it. What about the comment that the chief executive would naturally be rehabilitated after his behaviour? Well, what does that say? I think he can say? be naturally rehabilitated. I think he'll have to be actively rehabilitated. Uh, he, by the sounds of things, he'd, he'd, he'd had some earlier form in this regard. And he was a very popular guy. Popular guys often get away with stuff. But would a company employ someone of that level and basically say, it's okay, mate, you can continue to behave as you have done. Well, if they do, and they can be prosecuted, because it's illegal. And uh, you know, he will continue to be prosecuted for this issue. And I think he will be forever marked as that person unless he shows that he can actually um, act, um, perform to the highest possible ethical standards. And when you're a CEO, you're a leader of people. CEOs have three functions. You know, set the standards, set the directions, put the right people in the right places. Setting the standards and, and directions for organisations around these issues is absolutely fundamental. A lot of politicians, particularly Liberal politicians, have criticised your close links to the government. Is there some way, do you think, in the future this could be a liability? Oh, look, I, I, um, I don't play party politics. Our group's been around 137 years. We had our 137th annual general meeting a week or so ago. And that, one of the reasons is we've never, ever played party politics. I get involved in politics. That's why people make those sorts of comments about me. I'm in, I'm in it. I know it. And I, I don't mind it. I, I, get thing, I try to get things done. To get things done, you have to be involved in politics. But party politics is something that we just don't get engaged in. Uh, I didn't get engaged in that, that, that workforce, work choices campaign. I think I've probably paid a bit of a personal price for that. But what do you mean? Right thing. Oh, well, I've taken a lot of criticism for it um, by one side of politics. But I think people are getting over it now. And I think people know me well enough to know that I'm a pretty straight player. And that was the right thing to do by our members. And uh, I would do it again. Um, and as for my closest to the government, it's been very important that I work closely with the government. I work closely with the Howard government. It's enabled us to, to make things happen for our members. and. Um, I think uh, whether it's on workplace relations, whether it's on climate, uh, you have to work with the government of the day and if I can have a, a good working relationship with them, I'll take it any day. You love the public policy arena. If I could give you any job in the world, <laughs> what would you want to do? No, I don't know. The one I have. <laughs> I think my job has been so interesting. Uh, you know, my career hasn't been a linear progression. It's been characterised by having children and being the first female with a degree in this organisation, the first female director, the first female chief executive. And I've been learning all the way. I say to the staff every Christmas party, uh, I hope you did something you didn't think you could do this year at the start of the year. And that's the test I apply to myself. And I think uh, every year has been just a, a, a really interesting one. This year's been somewhat arduous. But uh, no, it's, uh, I think my job is the best job in the world. Heather Riddart, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jane.
Thank you. Craig Sylvie's book, Rhubarb, won rave reviews, but in trying to match its success with a quick follow-up, he thought he'd blown it. Jasper Jones has been hailed a success. It's been suggested an Australian to kill a mockingbird. It deals with racism and isolation in a small country town and was shortlisted for this year's Miles Franklin Literary Award. Rachel Brown spoke to Craig Sylvie in Edinburgh. Craig Sylvie, thank you for joining us on One Plus One. Jasper Jones is a novel about outsiders and secrets and three characters who don't fit into that machinery of a small country town. Can you set the scene? The, the book is narrated by a, a kid called Charlie Buckton who's kind of ostracised in this town called Corrigan in Western Australia for being this smart, bookish, shy kid. And um, late one evening uh, there's a tap at his window and it's uh, a kid called Jasper Jones who is uh, marginalised for, for other reasons. He's, he's mixed race, he's solitary, um, he comes from a broken home and he's kind of the kid in town that's, that's blamed for everything. They walk through town, uh, through the pastoral district and into the bush and it's here that, that Jasper shows Charlie this, this horrible crime. And what Jasper asks of Charlie is that he help him solve this because he knows as this kid in town that's going to get blamed for everything uh, that, that he'll be... Uh, held in suspicion for this event. As well as the boys coming of age, it's set in the 60s, which some commentators have said was Australia's political coming of age, which I know you disagree with. You've said in the past Australia may have become adult but may not have necessarily grown up. Can you expand on this? You know, I, I mean, I set out to write this book um, in the 60s because I wanted to write a Southern Gothic piece of, piece of fiction and I thought that it would just read a little more authentically if I, if I said it then. But once the book became about coming of age, um, once I realised that's the theme I wanted to explore, I realised that, yeah, I mean, the 60s is held aloft in Australia as a sort of uh, halcyon period of, of, of social politics. But, you know, I think one of the reasons that this book is so um, recognisable and identifiable now is that not so much has moved on, or certainly not as much as we give ourselves credit for. You know, I think that uh, maybe we're still kind of exist in that bubble of, of childhood. Is this inability of communities to accept difference something you're seeing today, say in immigration or issues of asylum seekers? You know, it's, it's the safety and the comfort of trading on a myth, you know. It's easier to, to believe things that you've been told. It's easier to kind of uh, trade in on a stereotype than it is to challenge the things that you previously thought to be true. And I, I think it's certainly topical today, you know, I think uh